Um, please open your Bibles to Ezekiel 18. I look back on my notes, and the title of the message has been used four times already in the last three and a half years. So I'm recycling the title, but uh, I guess it's the title you can't wear out. It's the most precious commodity in the world. And uh, that's how I started the first, the last message where I titled the message, The Blood of Christ. But I thank and bless God for this message. It's about the power of his dear son's blood. <clears throat> and if you have problems in your life, any, any and every problem is answered in Christ's blood. And until you see Christ's blood in your life, in that issue, you don't, you don't know anything. And boy, am I the first in line to have my eyes off of Christ's blood. And when it is, it's, it's, uh, it's terrible. It's painful. Life has so many corks and hurts that um, they're deeper and sharper when our eyes are off Christ. <clears throat> and we ought to, by God's grace, see Christ's blood, go back and look at that precious little lamb that was slaughtered for you. And all the goodness and righteousness that he stands for and is. And how evil you are of yourself. And in, therein you'll be refreshed for all the issues that you have. Before I read the text in Ezekiel 18, you need to keep mindful of the last message. The holy versus the profane. The holy being Christ's work and the profane being man's work. Man's work is such profanity and hate for God. It competes with Christ. It says I don't really need a portion of Christ, or I don't even need Christ at all. I can save myself based on my merit. And that's what sin is. Sin is believing, resting, trusting on yourself for salvation, on your own works. So keep this in mind as I read the text this evening in Ezekiel 18, starting in verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of his dad. Neither shall the dad bear the iniquity of the son. We're, we're individuals. And as individuals, we're going to come before thrice holy God. And the sin that we are, if we bear our own sin in that day of judgment, we're going to perish because of our own iniquity and sin. Or your relatives can't help you. I can't help you. I cannot help you. <clears throat> The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him. See how there's two camps in judgment? There's, there's those that have righteousness charged to them, and there's those that are still in original sin, and all they know and think is wickedness. They think they can do good and do right before God and save themselves. But verse 21, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. There's hope for sinners. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. This is resting on Christ's obedience. If you're resting on Christ's obedience, Nobody can accuse anything against you. The blood of Christ covers your sin, washes your sin away. Your sin's been dealt with by Christ, and your mind is purged from original sin. You'll never give cre credit to salvation to yourself or anybody else other than Christ alone. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? Somebody walk away from the gospel? Say, I once used to rest on the blood of Christ and now no longer is it important to me. I'm going to go out looking for false gods and, and rest on my own righteousness. Is, is that worthy of, of living, of having eternal life? This would make God iniquitous himself if he allowed somebody that walked away to be swept into his presence and accepted. It's ridiculous. All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed. And in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. 
promise from God. You walk away from this gospel, you'll die in your sin. The blood of Christ has not been applied to you if you walk away from this gospel. Yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. Oh, doesn't the world yell this out when they hear this gospel message that God saves who he wants? They say that's not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal and your and not your ways unequal? God says, let me put this right. My way is equal. And it's mercy and grace and justice and righteousness. You have no idea what the definition of these words even are until you're saved. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die? He has to die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. This is somebody who's been given a new heart to no longer sin, no longer look to their own works to save themselves. And to look to Christ exclusively as their, their obedience and their righteousness performed by Christ alone. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live and shall not die. God gives this to some people. To be turned by God Almighty is true repentance. To think you turn yourself is in original sin. You're still dead in your sin. The false church will say you have to make your own decision and turn your life around and choose God. That itself is a false covering. That is iniquity. That's still an original sin. You know nothing if you think you can choose God. God chooses who he will to save. But let it be known here this evening, plainly by way of introduction, sin must be paid for. Sin must be paid for. It's an absolute sure requirement. <clears throat> sin does not go unnoticed by God Almighty. He knows all sin. And he deals with his people's sin inside his son. And those that are outside of his son, he knows every one of them. Every one of those sins and all that iniquitous act, he knows every bit of it. There has to be blood applied either throughout eternity in your own sin, you'll perish in your sin, or the blood of Christ covers your sin. Either way, there has to be blood. If, if, if there's proper blood applied as a substitute applies to you, you are free as a bird. You're let go of the sentence of sin, the sentence of hell, the sentence of eternal destruction has been paid by your substitute and his blood is the very precious commodity that, see, that, that sealed the deal, that sealed the agreement, that sealed the covenant, the agreement between God the Father and God the Son. It's his blood that bought your pardon if you're in Christ. <clears throat> this, this text starts out in verse 20 where I read, The soul that sinneth it shall die. The wages of sin is death. He can... Google's a powerful tool, isn't it? If you, you want to know what occupation you're interested in as a young person, you can go to Google and say, what's a doctor make annually? What's a lab technician make annually? You can see what the wages of that occupation is. It's very easy to see nowadays. I know what sin will yield you. You sin but once in your life, it's an open declaration. Wrath, eternal. It's death. It's a declaration that you're dead. <clears throat> Why would you trust your own works to save you when you've sinned once? <laughs> it's impossible to save yourself. <clears throat> Knowing good and evil in the fall of Adam was a declaration that man believed that they had free will to choose one or the other. Man doesn't choose sin. We're born in it. It was charged to us by Adam and Eve. When Adam fell, all fell guilty to this condition of a sinner, the sin state, the fallen state, the helpless state, that you can't help yourself and you can't even perceive that you're lost. You know nothing about the lost state while you're yet in it. That's called deceived. In this deceived state, you go on doing more sin and iniquity, thinking that it makes you stronger and better and that there's hope in what you do. That's to be like as God. Like as if you can do something righteous. 
You're not God. You're not like as a God. You fell, you think you are, but you're not, and you can do nothing to cover your sin based on your works. God the Father will not accept man's works. He doesn't accept it. But some are given, by God's grace, to see that Christ's blood has been shed and applied to their body, that they're covered in the blood of Christ. <clears throat> some are given to turn. Jeremiah 31. Turn to Jeremiah 31. It's are the two verses that are the most direct and precious verses on repentance. It's God-given. Some people would read the text that I read tonight and say, see, you got to do something to prove you're serious about God. Man can do nothing but sin. Jeremiah 31, <clears throat> verse 18. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. The Ephraim was the one that received the blessing. Remember, the blessing of the firstborn. This one that received the blessing came to saving awareness, and he was bemoaning himself. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. What's a beast do when, they, when you put a yoke on him at first? You ever seen a horse broken or a beast broken? They kick and buck and freak out. They are, they, it's a new condition. They don't want anything to do with it. This is a repentance. The birth throes of a new heart are, I don't have comfort in what I used to do that I was religious in. There's no peace anymore in these things I used to do to justify myself before God. I'm a, I'm a wreck. I deserve hell and destruction. And I don't like this new condition of a mindset that I am doomed eternally. This is bucking around with this yoke. And he says it plainly. Turn thou me and I shall be turned. God, you're in control now. I thought I was all my life. I wasn't in control of one single, one single thing. God is sovereign over my life. You turn me and I shall be turned. For thou art the Lord my God. It's personal now. This gospel message went from something I just listened to once in a while and thought of. This is serious. I'm doomed of myself, and my God has revealed this to me. And this God is the real God. Surely after that, I was turned. I repented. And after that, I was instructed, and I smote upon my thigh, and I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, blown away by how religious I was. And all the things I used to trust in, they're trash. They're iniquity. They're false their hate for God, because I did bear the reproach of my youth from my very conception all the way to the point of salvation. Wicked, defiled, ungodly, self-righteous, just hate for God, trying to commit good works to try to just my, justify myself before God. What a, what a wicked God-hater. But Hebrews 9.22, he says, blood purges this. The blood of Christ will purge away this sin condition. Hebrews 9.22 says, Almost all things by the law purge with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. But it's by the, the very law of God says to purge your sin away. There has to be blood. There has got to be blood. <clears throat> the Passover is the, the earliest picture of a formal process of the substitute dying for his people. The Passover was an event where they took the lamb and they studied that lamb to make sure it's perfect, had to be blemishless, looked at every single feature, every single organ, every, every single part of that lamb, because if it's not perfect, we, we're going to die. This substitute has to die and it better be righteous. It better be separate from sin. It better not have a birth defect. It better be 100% whole. They looked for 14 days to make sure it's perfect. After they confirmed it was perfect, you kill it in the evening. God's direction, you kill it in the evening. You put the blood on the post above your house door, and you roast it and eat it. You roast it with fire. That, Christ's substitutionary death was tormenting for him. He 
absorbed all the throes of the pains of the torments of hell for his people and then was chewed up in it, devoured in it, beaten in it, and his blood over your head to cover you and to shield you. This Passover, this lamb is your source of salvation. <clears throat> Christ's blood has no blemish. This Christ, the Christ of the very Father, he's so perfect, so pure, we have a hard time even grasping his righteousness. We can't even, we, we, don't, we should, don't even have the right to say righteousness. Everything Christ is and was and ever will be is righteous, holy, and good. His blood over your head, you're righteous and holy and good. Consider that. You're justified by his blood. Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than being now justified by the blood, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from wrath. Did God just sidestep a step of the process of death when there's sin? No. He poured out all his wrath on his son for you in your place. And that's true salvation through the blood of his son. <clears throat> Turn to John 6, please. John 6 and verse 53 talks about Christ explaining that he's very life. He is life. He's the bread of life. And his blood, the wine, it's life. Verse 53, Jesus said unto the, these people around him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I am in, in him. Christ is saying, you have got to inherit his goodness, his righteousness. Your mindset has to be changed, repentant, to rest and to trust on his righteous work, on his substitutionary death. If your mind isn't resting on his body being beaten and bruised for you and his blood being shed for you, you're still in your sin. You have to eat this holy meal. <clears throat> As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. It's not, eat, it's not hard for an old Jew, Old Testament Jew to grasp this. He said, I came right down from heaven in the form of manna. And yet, this is the same one. The same one. This isn't just, it's, it's like the fathers did eat manna and are dead now. But he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said, he did in the synagogue and taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? They don't, they don't want to hear that you have to rely on Christ's substitutionary death and his blood to save you. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear about being religious and doing your own thing to save yourself. When Jesus knew, verse 61, in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascending up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, and the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Christ is saying, I give the spirit to rest on my blood to who I will through the spoken word. But there are some of you that believe not. You, you can't believe. So Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, said I, I said unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Christ levels down with them and says, Look, you can never rest on me. You can never believe on me. You can never drink my blood or eat of my flesh unless the Father make you. He has to make you willing in the day of his power. If you're not made willing, if you're not given by God the Father to rest on Christ's righteousness, 
You're off on your own righteousness. You're off on your own means of salvation. And you have a false Christ that you're resting and relying in. You have blood that's not holy enough. There's only one righteous, holy Savior. The Son of the living Father. And it's His blood alone that has power to shelter, atone, liberate, cleanse away sin, and secure and pardon you. It's the only way to do it. First of all, shelter in point two. Exodus 12, 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I, that's God the Father, see the blood, I, God the Father, will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. The plague is eternal death. That plague of eternal death was put on that little lamb in your place. And that's what Christ's role was and is and always will be as a substitute Savior for sinners. God the Father sees the blood of His Son. There's, there's no more wrath. It's all been paid for based on Christ's work. What a shelter. What a shelter. What a, what a place to be in. The cares of this world fade away. All your enemies in this life and the next to come can't touch you. They can do nothing against you. You yourself can't even condemn yourself. God Almighty's paid your debt. You're free. You're sheltered. You're under the blood of Christ. And the wrath of God is passed over onto Christ in your place and dealt with and it's gone forever. That's what atonement is. The word atonement is to be made at one with. Christ's blood atones also. Makes you at one minute with Christ, with God the Father. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon an altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for your soul. There's so many precious doctrines in the Word. I could preach all those doctrines for years and years. They'd never help you. If you don't hear about the blood, the atoning work of the blood of the true Christ, you'll never come to saving awareness. It's the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. The soul that sins? Yeah. You a sinner? If you say, no, I'm pretty good, it's not been shed for you. you say, all I am is sin, 100% sin, 100% iniquity, 100% evil. That's who it's applied to. You fit perfect with the perfect Savior. Um, but all these prisoners that are liberated. The next point is the blood of Christ liberates. Zechariah 9.11 as for, as for thee also, by the blood of the covenant, I have set forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. That pit is the wrath of God, and that's where Christ went in our place. He went to that pit and paid our penalty and there's no hope, there's no life there, there's no water there, but the life of all lives. The Lord Jesus Christ went there and was condemned for us and laid down his life and commended his spirit to the Father. And then out of the pit was resurrected alive and well because he in, him, in himself is righteous and holy and good. And now we are liberated in his resurrection. Christ's resurrection is the elect's resurrection. We were inside him while he was in the pit for us. And when he was resurrected out of the pit, we rose in him right up into heaven. <clears throat> and we're, we're, as prisoners, we're now free and liberated inside the Lord Jesus Christ, inside our substitute. The, the works of man, what does that look like now? What a foolish doctrine to think the works of man could liberate. How can the works of man go to the pit of hell and buy your pardon out? God won't accept him. That you'll stay in the pit of hell if you die trusting your works. <clears throat> the blood of his dear son, the only power to save if you haven't got it yet, cleanses away your sin. <laughs> and if anybody here is full of sin, and every spot that you see on yourself is completely a spot, every, just everything you look at, you open this up, you look at that, oh, there's a spot here. I'm a violator there. This is a... This is a problem. I'm the problem. This is, these are the ones that he cleanses. Cleanses. He cleanses us. Hebrews 9.22 says so. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. What's remission? 
I, I had the pleasure of watching my dad die of cancer. I say that's ridiculous. I say it's a pleasure. It, it's a blessing when you see God's grace in it, showing you what the word remission looks like. It's like he never had cancer. He walked around for months like he never had it. Like normal. Christ's blood puts you in the state of eternal remission as if you never sinned. You're healed. You're healed based on Christ's blood shed for you, washing away all your sin. <clears throat> There's sure remission based on righteous holy blood. <clears throat> and that's the secure and pardon <clears throat> that we have in Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 1 for our last point. We've got three passages on our last point that I want to show you. <coughs> Matthew chapter 1. <coughs> Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his mother Mary was in spouse to Joseph, they were newlyweds. Before they ever came together, they never had sex at this point. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She's pregnant already. Virgin. In their marriage, they hadn't had sex yet. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away pri uh, privily. That means just divorce her. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her to the Holy Ghost. She's not pregnant based on man's means. She's pregnant based on the Holy Ghost coming upon her and the Holy Ghost mixing inside her, and her body has the very God inside her, the very Christ, the very Messiah, the Holy One. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Why is this so significant? Because there's lots of shalls here. There's no option. Salvation is of no choice of man. God Almighty made the choice before the foundation of the world, and his son shall save each and every one of them with his blood. It's going to happen. There's no option. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. God Almighty stepped onto this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God the Father, became a man, dawned on human flesh, clothed himself righteous and holy in his heart and in his mind and all of his being, but his body, just simple human flesh like us. This thrice holy Savior walked on this earth, lived some 33 years. Every single thing he thought, did, and accomplished was good. The Father certified it and said, He's my Son in whom I'm well pleased. This Messiah, this Lamb of God the Father, is that precious one to look to for salvation. This precious one to rest on for salvation. There's nowhere else to go. There's no other source or resource in this world. You pile up all the money, all the gold, all the resources in one place and you bathe in it. It will not wash one sin away from you. It won't help you at all. Why are you going after it then? Think on Christ's blood. Think on His righteousness. Pursue the one that's able to wash your sin away easily to speak life into you. <clears throat> Matthew 26 is next, please. Turn to Matthew 26. This is the Last Supper. After Christ spent all those years living perfectly and righteously, declaring that he's the Messiah, he's the one to look to, he's the one to rest on, and he's going to shed his holy blood for his people. The Last Supper, he sat down and talked about it with his disciples. Matthew 26, verse 26. <clears throat> and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink, ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It 
those that receive this gift freely from my Father, my blood, my body broken, it's as if you never sinned. It, it, your sin's gone. This is a sure pardon. This is secure salvation. This is salvation that can never be stripped away from you. Nobody can come by and trick you and knock salvation out of your hand or tempt you away. It's impossible to fall away from grace. Grace is a free gift and you don't do anything to maintain it. You didn't do anything to get it. Grace is grace from the beginning all the way to the end of your life. <clears throat> Turn to John 19, lastly. This is Jesus on the cross, fulfilling all of God's holy word. <laughs> Literally, every bit of every jot and tittle, Christ did it. Fulfilled it easily. We, we can't do one thing right. And Christ did everything right. And as he's doing, fulfilling all the law, all the Old Testament requirements, declaring that he himself is holy. John 19, he last condition, naked on the cross, dying for his people. They cast lots and sell his clothing. That's fulfillment of the scripture. Everything he does fulfills the scriptures. He can't do anything wrong. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. That, that shows he's the one to look to. All the scriptures fulfilled in him. He says, I thirst. Well, there's Psalm 69. If you want to look at it later, you go ahead. Psalm 69 said, they gave me even vinegar for my thirst. So he, I'll fulfill that one too. I'm thirsty. Therefore, set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he drank it. He said, it's finished. It, his thirst was quenched. <laughs> no. He satisfied every single jot and tittle of this word. He fulfilled God the Father's demand of perfect obedience and righteousness, and he declared openly, you don't have to anymore, sinner. You don't have to do one thing to earn salvation, keep salvation. It's all finished based on His work for you on this cross of Calvary. His blood speaks eternally, surely for His people, and securely. You're safe and secure in these three little words. It is finished. It's finished. The use of the message tonight is 1 Peter 1.19. We don't have to turn there. It's at the bottom of your outline. Those of us that were redeemed, you weren't redeemed with the things of this world. You were redeemed or bought back to God the Father with the precious, the precious blood of Christ. I hope by God's grace you see how precious his blood is. The precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he fulfilled all the requirements that you can't do. Look to this Christ for your salvation. He's holy. And He provides shelter to you. He provides atonement to you. He liberates you. He cleanses away your sin. And He secures your pardon throughout all eternity. Look to this Savior. I thank the Lord for the message. And ask Him to save His people.